This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. When um, Chris asked me to join this panel today, um, I think he said, please come and talk about British and then in brackets, and Irish, it's <laughs> <laughs> a Greek tragedy. And I, I played with that idea. <laughs> We've already heard um, from Pantelis that, of course, no one would deny, and we're here, I know from Miriam, that uh, thinking about Greek tragedy, performing Greek tragedy, we have to know something about French. Um, theatre practitioners, French theorists, how they've received Greek tragedy. No one would deny that. And of course, going back a little bit, the whole of the 19th century understanding of Greek tragedy really would not have happened without, I think, the Germans. However, I think if anyone, except anyone as crazy as me, were to say, we really do not fully understand the reception of the tragedy without putting the Irish centre stage, um, I think I'd have some work to do. Now, of course, looking at your um, sheet in front of you, you know that that is not the case from the 1980s onwards. I wouldn't have any difficulty convincing you uh, from the 80s onwards with that rash of Antigone, um, many of which um, are still very um, important today. People have re-performed Tom Paulus, The Riot Act, um, and show that it's not simply a play uh, about the troubles um, from the 70s and, and, and through to the 80s, but very much um, a play that still works today. Um, Kennedy's Antigone uh, may be less familiar, but is, 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 is still very much performed. And then, of course, <coughs> From Seamus Heaney's 1990 Cure of Troy, we have this extraordinary number of, of, of Greek tragedies. And as you see, I, I rather cowardly sort of stopped in 2010. Um, and I, I know that my list is not exhaustive. Um, I also know of at least uh, three Irish versions that are very much in the pipeline. McGuinness has an Antigone. Um, already written. He has also done A Trojan Women. He's got a libretto of the Thebans, which um, I think the ENO are interested in. And I also know that Marina Carr has got a Hecuba. So in a way, you know, this list um, is growing all the time. So from the 1980s, I, I know I have a very strong case, but I want to be bolder and I want to say that really Anglophone reception, uh, performance reception anyway, would not have happened without the Irish contribution. I don't want this to sound like part of a, a bigger conceit, which one might often hear, and that is that really there's no such thing as British theatre history, it's really Irish theatre history. <laughs> and, and of course, in some ways, if you think about that claim, um, of course it's true, because, or at least post-Renaissance, it's true. Um, and after a, a significant contribution from French Huguenot um, settlers um, at the end of, uh, end of the 17th century, I think really from 1800 onwards, one could make a case that British theatre history is indeed Irish. And of course, you know, who are the great 18th century playwrights? British playwrights? We don't think about them, hear about them sadly very often anymore, but of course they're Goldsmith, they're Farquhar, um, and um, they're Sheridan all Irish. And in the 19th century, who was the blockbuster biggest um, playwright? Luckily, Nick Heidner seems to like him as well. Uh, Dion uh, Boussico, um, who uh, stole not only the London stage, but also New York, um, was equally um, you know, overwhelmed by him. And he was really the first multi-millionaire playwright. He made money out of, um, out of his work. So, until then, <coughs> or rather in the 19th century, and of course, I don't need to remind you that, um, and, and in fact, I think it was Ben Levitas, who's uh, in, in the drama department at Goldsmith, who was the first to say something which I think was just brilliant, and that is the Royal the Court Theatre, the Royal Court Theatre, where, of course, Gilbert Murray 
um, put on um, his his productions, or sorry, his translations of of Euripides, um, directed by 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 Granville Barker. Um, we should really think about the Royal Court's event as the Abbey Theatre's um, London outpost, because, <laughs> and it's actually a, a really interesting point because. Shaw was much more interested in getting stuff on in, in the Abbey and actually failed on a number of occasions to do so. But he was much more interested in what was happening in the Abbey. And of course, the Abbey was regularly touring to the court theatre. So, really, Ireland has um, an Irish theatre, both um, playwrights and practitioners, and really that's, that's my major point, have um, been absolutely key to the performance reception of Greek tragedy. Um, and I, I really, really like um, Shaw, <laughs> as ever, uh, but particularly Shaw's wonderful observations about um, cultural life um, this side of the water. As Shaw said, England had captured Ireland, so there was nothing for it but to come over and conquer England. Um, and, of course, <coughs> that, that happened in, with the Abbey Theatre from 1904 on, onwards. But we can go way back and see how conquering England in terms of shaping England's perceptions of Greek tragedy, particularly the potential for performance of Greek tragedy, has a long history. Um, and it can start um, in the 1720s um, because although people tend to think that um, the uh, tradition of performing Greek plays began here, as of course it must do, at uh, Bradfield School. Uh, in fact, it began, it can be dated from the 1720s in Dublin, when uh, uh, Thomas Sheridan, Dr. Thomas Sheridan, uh, the father of the actor Thomas Sheridan, and the grandfather of, of Richard Brinsley Sheridan, the playwright, um, began um, to make his young pupils uh, perform Greek tragedy because he realised, not so dissimilar of course to the Jesuits um, uh, across the water, that this was one way not only of understanding um, of, of, of course the ancient Greeks but intrinsically um, to understand um, and, and, and open up uh, to his pupils uh, important ethical, metaphysical um, ideas as well. So, if you look at um, the, the list in front of you, um, and <coughs> also, sorry, much more important than looking at the list at the moment, um, have a look at the screen. And I've just got a few images here. I wasn't even sure I was going to be able to show you uh, images. But these are just a sample. There's Holly Hunter, that sort of famous American actress who came here and um, I thought was really rather wonderful um, in Marina Carr's version of Medea called By the Bog of Cats. Uh, but people found her West uh, Midland accent extremely difficult, but Marina Carr assured me it was very authentic. Um, but um, also, uh, Frank McGuinness, who undoubtedly has become the playwright. Um, of choice when one wishes to write a Greek tragedy, or so it seems, or when one wants to stage a Greek tragedy. And um, this is his, his first um, production, it was the Electra, I'm sure many of you saw it. And in a way, the, the sort of Balkan setting, it was staged in London, um, but the Balkan in 1997, I think, and the Balkan setting was in a way very misleading. Because as McGuinness said, and, and I think it's in the MacDonald and Walton uh, volume uh, Amidst Our Troubles, um, as he said, um, and, and, and I have asked him about this, um, he saw Electra, I think it's a very interesting way of seeing Electra, before many saw Electra as an abused woman, young woman, and he saw her very much as he saw in his previous um, play, which was a, a very moving monologue called Bag Lady. Um, he was actually translating the Electra at the same time as he was writing Bag Lady. It was, he said, he stand in Sophocles play, really that cry for release, for recognition that he found uh, in 
the particular woman on the streets who, who became the centre of Bad Lady. He found that in, in, in Sophocles' um, Electra as well. Now, those are the playwrights, um, but also um, that's uh, Fiona Shaw, because of course the Irish haven't just given us texts, they've also given us extraordinary actresses. And I think for, for, for many people who are as old as I am here, and I'll argue you, uh, you will know that the definitive Sophocles Electra was not actually Zoe Wanamaka, but a few years before that was in fact Fiona Shaw in Deborah Warner's production. And um, less the kind of um, abused woman um, of, of, of McGuinness's um, bag lady Electra um, that of course here um, a, a very disturbing study of psychosis as Deborah Warner uh, um, uncovered through Fiona Shaw's um, quite extraordinary performance. So we can go even a little bit further back and I think to see that practitioners and contributions um, are, and this is another absolutely milestone production, this is the 1955 um, film, or sorry, the 56 film, I'm happily for probably correct, but I think the, the first production uh, of which this is the second year's filmed uh, um, version of Oedipus Rex by the Irish director Tyrone Guthrie, um, which was first performed at the Stratford Ontario, Ontario um, Festival in Canada. Now Guthrie um, is not only the person I think who one could say is responsible through the filming of this extraordinary production. So you can say extraordinary because of the use of these um, larger than life, literally masks. Um, he's not only responsible for the filming, and therefore I really think the internationalization of, of, of Greek tragedy. He also <coughs> really, through this film, put around the world the text that he used, which was Yeats's Oedipus text, um, center stage. And we can go back just a few years before that to the landmark stage production, which also used the Yeats text, which is um, the very famous production at the Old Vic, just after the war, at the end of the Second World War, 1945, uh, when Laurence Olivier took the part of, of, of Oedipus. Um, and, I mean, I've written at length elsewhere, uh, elsewhere, and I don't want to kind of bore you with it, but bear with me and just believe me that it really is the Yeats text, the Irish idioms of the Yeats text, that um, enabled Olivier famously to emit this extraordinary scream, which, um, of course, uh, perhaps only Olivier could um, uh, render, and the scream that in many ways anticipates, of course, the famous Beckettian scream of, of uh, post-Second World War theatre, in many ways, but it's definitely gone down the annals of theatre history as such. So that, in, albeit again happening in London, is really, I think, arguably an Irish production. Now, I just want to, in a way, elaborate on, on those general points by saying then that the contribution is, in terms of text, that the playwrights um, and poets really um, since Yeats, and no doubt because of Yeats' example, have in Ireland somehow felt that tackling Greek tragedy was a kind of rite of passage. And it's also significant, if you look on the list, that um, if Yeats in 26, 27 finally had his versions of, of, of Oedipus, both the OT and the OC stage, um, what is noticeable is the absence of Oedipuses from this list um, until 2005 when Derek Mann wrote an Oedipus that was very much part um, of, if you like, a countercultural engagement with Greek tragedy, which I also think is very important in Ireland, um, and particularly the Oedipus myth. So um, in many ways, I think Mann is doing as J.M. Singh was doing in um, 1907, in Playboy with the Western world, engaging parodically uh, with Sophocles' play. 
So Yeats, in a way, has set the bar very high in terms of, 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 of Oedipuses, um, because his text still remains very much a, a, an Oedipus of choice for people who don't have any money to commission a new text. Um, but he also, in a way, has thrown down the gauntlet. Any playwright, any poet playwright, as you can see, um, now feels somehow um, the need to do precisely that. <coughs> and she was here, of course, in 2004, um, when it was the centenary of the Abbey Theatre, um, was asked by the theatre, of course, not to write an Oedipus, because they already had an Oedipus, but actually to write the Antigone that the Abbey never had, because um, Yeats had planned to write an Antigone, and as you know, he has um, translated very <coughs> small bits of the Antigone, uh, but he didn't write it, um, he looked and even asked if he could use Cocteau's Antigone, actually, and stated it um, as part of a trilogy in the, in, in, in the Abbey, but he never did. And of course, Heaney in 2003, when he got the commission, was really aware of the burden, the burden of precedent, and has written really eloquently um, on how could he possibly write um, an Antigone. He doesn't actually explicitly mention um, Yeats. He's more concerned about the currency um, of those 1980s Antigones, which are absolutely engaged with the troubles. And Heaney, of course, um, finds a way out of that deadlock. He does not want his Antigone to be an explicitly political play, however it's been received since. He turned instead to a much richer and, I think, fruitful scene uh, in Irish literary tradition. And he turned to um, the 18th century um, Ashling poetic, lyric tradition, uh, in order, as he says, I found in the commerce of Antigone, I found a voice, I found a distinctly Irish voice, I turned to traditional um, 18th century Irish lyric. Um, so in order, if you like, both to escape Yeats and the Yeatsian voice, as well to escape the voice of Paulin and his contemporaries in the 80s, Heaney went back to uh, an older tradition. So those are the texts. We've got glorious texts, um, and um, I'm, I, well, I, I can't think of any great um, translations, versions that one can put against many of these. And some of you might say, what about McNeese's Agamemnon? Well, I'm sorry, I've appropriated, reappropriated McNeese to my Irish list, because of course, even if there were generations who rejected McNeese as being a kind of hideous kind of West um, uh, Britain, he, uh, he, he nonetheless um, longly and um, uh, what, longly in, and man now, of course, see the voice of McNeese as absolutely being the voice of, of their immediate um, kind of forefather. So, not to fall. And, and I, I, I was struck, I'm trying to hang around for time, right? I, okay, five minutes, okay. Um, uh, I was struck by Pantelis showing his fantastic picture of 1927, Prometheus, um, uh, in Delphi. What, what is striking is, around about the same time, <laughs> in Cambridge, um, at um, the Festival Theatre, uh, under the direction of Terence Cave, we have some equally exciting choruses happening, happening um, and uh, being choreographed by someone called Edris Stanis, who may well be better known to you all as Nina de Valois, the <laughs> of the Royal Family. Because Terence Cave um, had an Irish cousin, and of course he was Irish as well, and um, she went on, as I think, to have a very distinguished career in ballet. But she cut her teeth in <coughs> the company of Cave in Cambridge, and she choreographed for Cave choruses for his Oristana, also for a Prometheus, and also for an Antigone. And in fact, when Ava Palmer, who choreographed those choruses, comes to London, she goes to talk to uh, Ninette de Valois. Um, and she then, uh, Ninette de Valois, went and worked with Yeats. He was 
um, particularly interested, and she came, went back um, to Dublin, and uh, she choreographed a number of his so-called dance plays from 27 to 34, and she also started um, a ballet school which still exists uh, in, in, in Ireland called Ballet School. So there, and, and people even, you know, um, choreographers are really interested in the work she did with Penn Theatre. She cut her teeth on, on, on Greek tragedy. Um, so I think dance, um, and Yeats was someone, of course, who, who devised something called dance plays. People often think of these as being his Japanese no plays, but of course, in many ways, they are. He takes the immediate inspiration from no drama. He was working, worked with, with Pound um, uh, doing, I think it was 1916 to 1918 on the Fenelosa manuscripts of, of no drama. Um, they worked together and, uh, in, in, in a cottage in Kent. And um, <coughs> they then got hold of a Japanese no dancer. But actually, if you do any research on Michio Ito, he was not a no dancer at all. He was just simply Japanese. Where he had done his training was with the Dennis Shaw Company <laughs> in the United States, where they were looking to what they thought was Greek dance as their inspiration. So in many ways, I, I would argue that the dance plays are intrinsically uh, uh, Greek, and, um, and, and in a very real sense, even if the layering um, is, is, is Japanese, fundamentally. So movement, I think, was something that is very much um, thanks to, to, to the Irish. Um, if we look at the first two plays, John Todd Hunter's Alcestis and his Helena in Troas, in particular in 1886, uh, many of you will know that that production, 1886, was a landmark production. It was the first um, uh, production uh, inspired by the Greeks to take place in a so-called authentic Greek theatre. Um, and it was uh, a theatre uh, just at um, Oxford Circus in Argyle Street. And the architect, E.W. Godwin, designed this space, um, this theatre in the circus ring, as it was called. And many years later, Yates realised how important that was. Now, sorry, I've omitted the obvious. Um, and that is that John Hunt, Todd Hunter was Irish. He was an Irish doctor resident in London who just happened to write plays inspired uh, by, by the Greeks. So in terms of form, um, and I won't, I mean, I think musical theatre, um, and, 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 and I, I could give you 19th century examples of why Greek tragedy really <coughs> mattered so much in, in, in Dublin and, and musical theatre. But I, I'll run on just two um, to, to, to sort of somehow say that it looks like an, un, uh, an interrupted tradition, as you look here randomly. You see after Yeats's Oedipuses, there's something weird going on in the 30s in Dublin with um, the Longfords doing the Oristia. Actually, uh, uh, that's at the Gate Theatre in Dublin, uh, a really exciting and adventurous place where not just the Oristia was performed, but an Oedipus was performed, a Bacchae was performed. In many ways, um, People tell the history of Irish theatre at this time as if it were a return to social realism, and that's very true of the Abbey, but not true of the Gate. Um, but there isn't such a big jump from 36 or 35, uh, the Gate, to Tom Murphy's The 70s. Because as people have also pointed out, I've, I've mentioned Terence Kane and his connections with Nina de Valois. And I've also mentioned Guthrie, and Guthrie really is key, because Guthrie, although he went to Canada, really remains very much connected to Irish theatre. And if once, um, uh, in, on numerous occasions, but particularly in an interview that I recently came across, Brian Friel was asked who was his mentor. And of course, Brian Friel not only wrote that wonderful play of translations, he also wrote um, The Living Quarters, inspired by the Hippolytus. And Friel said my mentor was Tyrone Guthrie. And there was a sense in which, from the very beginning in Friel's work, Greek tragedy, both in terms of its content and, of course, in terms of its form, really mattered. 
And um, in some ways, you know, there is an elephant in, in the room, and the elephant in the room is Beckett. And I don't actually want to um, uh, present a case to say that in some ways, um, the greatest um, exponent of, 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 of Greek tragic form um, is Beckett. But I know that's already been done, and some people are nodding, uh, in a fantastic little piece in a volume I, I co-edited with, with, with colleagues at the APGRD um, by Catherine Work, who was really the authority on Beckett. So I'm going to stop here, um, uh, and I just hope um, I have reminded Chris <laughs> that um, when you ask me to talk about um, British theatre, it, it, it's not about bracketing off Irish. It really is. is it, it's impossible to separate the two.